Hi, this is Richard Cavill from Donnet Rocks and Run As Radio here at the SSW Studios in NBC, Sydney. And I'm sitting with Yane Kafta. Hi, Richard. Uh, thank you for having me here. Did I pronounce uh, your name correctly? Yes, uh, although you can just call me JK. Okay, I'll call uh, you It's JK. much easier to pronounce and I kind of don't react anymore to your name anymore. <laughs> okay, JK is better then. Yes. Uh, what have you been working on? So I've been working uh, on teaching people uh, doing machine learning, uh, kind of introducing them, hey, machine learning is actually pretty wide and hard, but for instance, if you use something like ML.net, uh, you can actually get into machine learning much easier. And if it doesn't really fit your scenario, let's say you need more complicated machine learning, mm -hmm. you now have a, some of the basics to carry on, say go to TensorFlow or CNTK, which is the uh, Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, go from there. So f most of the time when I think about machine learning, I think about data scientist types, really data types using this. But you're talking about developers when you say ML.net? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So for developers, we really need to uh, know a sprinkle of uh, data science uh, to be able to make a prototype and then try it out on production data, see how it goes, mm -hmm. and then have a human to verify are we getting the results we're expecting? Or do we need to uh, get some data scientist uh, to look at the data and see, hey, this is what you need to do? Interesting. So yeah. certain levels of complexity, you kind of want to defer to the pros? Yes. Okay. Uh, and yeah, basically what I want is for people being able, for developers being able to identify scenarios, look at the data and say, hey, actually we can do something with machine learning, let's have a prototype. And if if it looks like this, this actually could be something real, mm -hmm. they can pull in data scientists, they can do some experimentations, maybe even the prototype will be good enough, mm -hmm. especially if you have you know, someone to check the results, uh, or the results are not you know, life critical. Right. Um, and, you know, if, if it doesn't work with your prototype, there's a good chance that if you bring a data scientist, that they'll also struggle getting Probably some good results. Probably won't work result. there either. Yeah. I find it interesting, if you know what your expected results are, do you really need machine learning? Could you just do this more alg algorithmically? The answer is sort of a yes, <laughs> except if you have such a huge data set sure. that making algorithms becomes impractical. Right. So if you think about uh, traditional algorithms, you have the algorithm mm -hmm. that based on the data give you a result. Machine learning gives you an algorithm based on the data. Right. So it's like a rever uh, reverse engineering our process. Right. I know the inputs. I know what my expected outputs are. Find me the algorithm that gets that consistency across a larger set of data. That's correct. That's the machine learning approach as opposed to I have the inputs. I know the rules. Tell me the outputs. That's correct. I think I saw that diagram one time. Oh, yeah. This is a simple <laughs> diagram on Twitter. Fortunately, I don't have it over here. but That's fine. Yeah, it's super <laughs> So what scenarios? Can you paint me a scenario where ML.net would make sense in an existing application? So we have on government, for instance, uh, classifying offenses okay. uh, where uh, people are just describing uh, what the offense is. A criminal and, offense? Yeah. Okay. And then you can classify them really quickly so uh, people can uh, box them quickly and then process the high priorities against the low priorities. Okay. So for instance, if a child needs to have... Um, uh, what's the word, um, they need to be uh, protected. Right. Uh, that case can be then put a really high priority, sure. go to court really quickly and process and make sure that the child is safe, rather than being that limbo where a human actually need to go through all of the cases right. before they get to that one very important so one. To be able to do that quick sort, sort of bubble yes. those highest priority items up yeah, and for a human to say, yeah, you're right, that's really high priority, let's go. Yeah, and that's uh, text input. Mm -hmm. So there's no good way, unless you put in a form, uh, hey, this is high priority, but everyone will Everyone's always going to check high priority. So yes. to actually have parse the description to decide priority is really interesting. Yeah. And one case that I have uh, for my personal use is uh, bank transaction classification, hmm. where I basically get all real data from my bank uh, provider 
And based on description, I try to categorize all the backdrop sections. Right. So I don't have to spend weekends doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a more simpler uh, thing uh, that I do. And this is also what I uh, show the developers. And I always feel like that's a low risk example. Yes. Because if you get a few misclassified bank transactions, it beats the heck out of a, a child in danger. So that's correct. If you're going to learn on something, learn on that. That's correct. <laughs> okay. So we can have a look at uh, the uh, things that I have prepared. Sure, let's, say, let's go. Yeah, so if you want to start, you can go to ML.net uh, website. Uh, what we're going to uh, use for the first demo is actually the model builder. And you can imagine ML.net is the SDK to do the machine learning, mm -hmm. whereas the model builder is a wizard. Oh, nice. And this is new, right? ML has been yes. around for a little while now, but the model yeah. builders just, just recently. Yeah, it's really uh, interesting because I started with ML.net as the camps. Like, wow, this is easy. Then the re uh, released the version one. It was like, wow, this is more easy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very fascinating um, how much easier you can do machine learning with just making the UI better. Interesting. to understand what you're actually doing and what the output is going to be. So a little less abstract mathematical, a little more click, drag, draw kind of construction. That's correct. And even when you go into code, you're doing more of a what is the input that I get in, uh, into, what is my scenario, and how do I want to those specific columns to mm -hmm. be processed? Rather than thinking about what specific training algorithm I want to do, what is, are the algorithm, uh, inputs uh, for mm -hmm. those training algorithms and stuff like that. You can uh, go into them, but it's not the focus. Right. So I can show you basically how you can really quickly get started with okay. that. So first we'll go to the uh, uh, Visual Studio. For some reason, you have to have a project uh, open. Right. Uh, and then you. And that, that's sort of got to be the typical scenario, right? I have yeah. an existing application. I'm looking to add ML.NET to it. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, it will actually create you a, another console application. Okay. So if it's going to create another console application, why do you need. Yeah, why do I need the first application? <laughs> yes, that's correct. But, but this the, is the way Model Builder works. That's correct. Okay. And once you click on the project, do add and add machine learning, mm -hmm. uh, you already are greeted with scenarios. So I'm not thinking about you know what kind of machine learning I want to choose, what training algorithm. What I'm thinking about is what I actually want to do. Sure, a little more yeah. the description of the problem space. Yes, right? correct. In this case, what I'm going to do is try to classify bank transactions. And what I'm going to do is issue classification. Okay. So this is funny enough. I so used, there, were, there were really only three categories there, and then the yeah. okay, do what you want. That's correct. Right. So machine learning uh, uh, is much much bigger than that. It's sure. really really huge. So we are looking only at a small subset of machine learning, but the, uh, this small subset allows you to really quickly go into machine learning, try to understand what you do, uh, what machine learning actually the is. Issue classification sounds like. Pretty broad, actually, yeah. just about any set of data you want to sort into categories. But interestingly enough, it's a small, small part of machine learning. Interesting. But it could be hugely beneficial. I, I, That's I, I dig this. For your average forms over data app, issue classification can be really, really useful. That's correct. That's cool. Yeah. And if you have something like autocomplete, where you're just like, hey, I think this is uh, what you want. Right. And the uh, person's like, yeah, that's it. Or it's like, no, nah, nah, not really. Not Close good enough. enough but yeah. I can change it. Do we tune it? Do we try it a different way? Because there is more behind all of this. You yes. haven't you haven't actually gone on a path that restricts you. Yeah. OK. All so, right. So we're doing a little issue classification. Now what? I'm going to do file, but you can do a SQL Server. They're going to add support for more uh, data sources. All right. And the second decision you have to do is where do you get the file? Right. So I'm going to take a CSV, which classic uh, is actually having thousands of transactions, real transactions from my uh, bank. Okay. And now, I'm do we have to start thinking the machine learning thing? Like I have a training set and a testing set. Like, am I worried about that yet? In this case, you you just have to be aware of it. Okay. So when we start doing training. It's actually going to split. I'm going to go back to that once we start awesome. training. This, I'm jumping ahead. Then this tool is yeah. going to help me with this. So yes, I've only pointed correct. it at one set of data, and it knows better than just use it all as the training set. Yes, ah, it's lovely. Yeah, actually, let's do the third decision, which is what do I want to predict? Okay, 
And for now, let's keep all the columns in. All right. And which makes a lot of sense, right? We yeah. take as much data as you have, see what you can get. But you're trying to get it to derive a category. We'll get back to that. <laughs> so first, uh, I know that um, for this uh, size, uh, a good option is about 30 seconds. Really? Yeah. That's a pretty quick trade. So Are we using the cloud here or is it just running on your machine? This is all on my machine. And if I have a much beefier graphics card, mm -hmm. it would be a bit uh, faster. Actually, so it is using the GPU in your laptop. Yes, that's correct. So, that's cool. So if we go to GPU, you can actually see, I think uh, because it's recorded, the results are a little bit skewed, but you can see there's a That GPU is working hard. It's like you're playing Halo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're currently recording the screen, so it's a little bit uh, false positive, but okay. we should be able to see a little Drop bump down, down here. Yeah, so I see like one to five percent usage uh, when yes, uh, using. Which typically machine learning. running in studio would be zero. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but the. Yeah, so that's actually the recorder effect. But yeah, you definitely yeah. see a tip down there. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it is using uh, GPU, yeah. which is very interesting. So you don't have to uh, do anything uh, about that. Mm -hmm. And what we can see here is we get about uh, 84 to 85% uh, accuracy, usually with this. Uh, so I'm now, I'm now impaired by knowing too much about machine learning, but it suddenly yeah. hits me. So it split the set. It ran yes. a test, the, the test set and then evaluated against the rest. Yes. And you're not overfitted. Like, wow, yes. a lot of work just happened. Yes. In 30 seconds. Yes. And the thing is, like, I don't know exactly what the percentage is going to be because it randomly samples the training right. data and the evaluation. So I know that it's going to be between 84 and 85 because I have lots of transactions and there's a lot of similar transactions. Now, I don't feel like 85 is good. Am it's, I wrong? So for this use case, it's actually OK because okay. I'm the, the one that verifies and think about the 15% are usually the edge cases, right. the, the things that don't happen very And, and it's going to show you uncertainty, so you can yes. easily get to that 15%. So it has taken 80% of the work or 85% of the work off of you, given it's correct. Yeah. Well, actually, in my use cases, I see it. it's almost closer to 95%. Wow. Okay. Because those 15% happen very rarely. Right, right. But in certain cases, those 50% could happen much more frequent. Right. So you have to test it out and see uh, in real world, you know, how much does uh, that accuracy uh, impact? Because it's really based on your use cases. Mm -hmm. You only might have a couple of edge cases, but how many times they actually happen in the real world? Right. This test case, it, it's coming up 15% of the time, but yes, might be less than others. At the same time, we get back to this whole idea of machine learning not replacing work, but taking away unnecessary work so that you can focus on the smaller set that's really important and do a good job on that. Yes, and this is emphasis if you don't have a data scientist, if you don't have a lot of time investment mm -hmm. into making automated system that is very reliable. Right. This is just, you know, a developer uh, takes an hour, plays around a little bit, has a prototype that can be shipped to production. Yeah. As long as somebody checks it, you know, you get add value to the product sure. without actually investing a lot of time. No, no. And, 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 and arguably saving, if somebody has to classify all those items anyway, and you just made 85% of them done, they're pretty happy. Like the amount of work just went down substantially for not a lot of effort. Yes. But if we put a little bit of data as science, mm -hmm. let's see, say, if you understand a little bit about classification, what you know is classification isn't really good with noise. Okay. And one, uh, and the best uh, example of noise is date. Date. On bank transactions. Of course, that's nobody noise. Think, nobody thinks about it, but it's like, how is a arbitrary date related to the category. Interesting. I mean, if you have Monday, Tuesday, Friday, uh, Wednesday, uh, Saturday, it's that's relatable. It's, you can figure out something. Sure. If you have time, like time slot, well, it's breakfast, uh, it's dinner and stuff like that. But if you have a specific date, it happened on that date, what does that tell you? Yeah, not a lot. Yeah. So, but it can keep the model busy unnecessarily. Yes. So you're so, going to take date out of the training. Yeah. And what we should see is 
I'm so not now another 30 second run, yes. you're reprocessing this. So yeah. this is literally yeah. a refactoring. You've gone back and you're doing it again. Yeah. And just removing date. Like I feel like I could hack at this at 30 second intervals. Let's just turn some things off and see how we do. And that's exactly what I'm showing people. It's mm -hmm. like, hey, now you can open a CSV. Uh, either modify the columns, mm -hmm. uh, maybe when you import the CSV, just make some modifications. Right, a little uh, data cleaning. Yes, and then all of a sudden you're getting uh, different results. Like sure. previously we had 84%, now we have 85%. All right, so and, improvement. Yeah, and sometimes even bumps to 86%. And Again, just, you never know with this demo because it literally is randomly selecting data. In some yeah. ways it's more honest by using the model builder than it would be by any typically contrived machine learning model. That's exactly right. That's really cool. You know, the other thing that I realized is you don't actually need most of these values. Uh, this is something that came directly from the bank transaction. Right. This is a uh, raw dump of provide. data. And what I realized is the expense amount and in-memory currency is always the same. The currency the and main currency are always Australian dollars. And I only exported uh, income, so uh, right. expenses. So I don't have any income here, so that is not uh, useful. Sure. So what I can do is a little trick for anyone who has more than uh, six columns. Mm -hmm. Is there you, a minimum number of columns I want? You won't be able to scroll down. <laughs> oh no, columns. it's a bug. <laughs> yes. That's not good. But how you can solve this is clear all. Right. You select the one that you can select uh, as a label, right? And you go back to the one that you want to do uh, uh, label. So now you're down to really just two columns. Yes. The uh, the uh, the category and the description. Yes. And the reason why I want to remove most of the stuff is if you really think about what amount uh, means is. Unless you have a deep learning uh, model, usually the description is going to tell you what the category is. Sure. There's some very uh, specific cases like Uber, where you have uh, Uber as driving and Uber as Uber Eats. Right, two different and, products. And they have the same description. Right. But everything else have a unique description and the amount actually doesn't uh, contribute no, much and, and except makes... for those two cases. Right. So, do you want to actually lose the ability to differentiate uh, those two and have much simpler model and also much simpler input? Because mm -hmm. now you don't have to input uh, amount. Right. Or do you want to have more data just so that you can distinguish those two? Uh, that's, a yag, that's a Yagni problem. You ain't yeah. going to need it. Yeah. And also account is an uh, interesting uh, example mm -hmm. of overfitting because transactions should be the same whether I'm using a Visa, MasterCard, sure. and stuff like that. But if you have account, what it's going to do is going to uh, correlate the account you're using with the description name. Right. It might vary so, the category accordingly. Yeah. So when you switch the credit card, uh, your accuracy is going to go down. Right. So for bank transactions, usually the best thing is just to use the description and then the label, right? And maybe a couple of more uh, uh, columns if they're really good. Mm -hmm. Date, for instance, if you convert it to actual days, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Day of the week. It's it's okay, mm -hmm. but most of the time you're actually not getting the date of the purchase, but date of being processed. Right, which can be easily off by a day or two. Yes, which right. doesn't make it useful. Yeah, in fact, it's it's basically yeah. dirtying the data at that point. That's correct. So now if we train this, what we will see is that the accuracy actually uh, won't go as much down as you would think. Like hmm. we removed We've removed data. That's counterintuitive that it would be better with less data. Yeah. The only exception is if we have uh, columns that are direct correlation. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, the service that I'm using also have uh, tags, mm -hmm. uh, which basically um, you know, you have that could be a classification yeah. and tag. So tag already tells you what ca uh, category you're using. Right. So if you have that column, it's just completely wrong because that's not the data. First, that's not the data you're getting mm -hmm. when you're having the bank transaction. That's also a part you want to predict. Right. And the second thing is it's directly correlated. It's like almost one to one. Right. So it's not really useful. It's not useful. 
So here we have 84%, which is interesting. Sometimes it bumps to 86, sometimes to 84. There's not uh, a lot of play here though, but I'd like that the model is significantly simpler. Yes, now I can just write a description and boom, done. Sure. And we can get a little bit more details over here. Right now I have run only one uh, model mm -hmm. uh, for 30 seconds. Usually I think the CPU is currently very busy. If you run it for a little bit longer, it's going to use a lot of more different trainers, which basically means it looks at the data and tries to learn from data a little bit differently. Now, if I'm, so if I'm willing to go get a coffee in between each run, I could just, you know, set it for 6,000 seconds and... Yes. Okay, I, I go a long way for coffee, but yeah. <laughs> but I, I yeah. get the idea that maybe a 10 minute run is probably worthwhile. Yes, and 30 seconds usually is uh, good enough, mm -hmm. but unfortunately right now we are recording and a lot of resources have been taken by... Sure, the machine's the busy doing the recordings as yeah. well. But no, I, I totally appreciate that a longer run time is absolutely worth it. Yeah. Just a few minutes to do a bathroom break, whatever that may be, and, and see how the results are different. Yeah, and interestingly enough, I actually found out that doing multiple runs mm -hmm. for 120 seconds, for instance, seems to give you better results, at least in the percentage, than uh, having it run for the same amount of time in one One run. big run. Yeah. Wow, why would that be? Uh, right. It's probably just a correlation, just okay. luck, but maybe there's something uh, to it. Going on there. But, you know, yeah. Model Builders is in V1, as is yes. ML.net. So yeah. I'm sure more is coming here. Yeah, and the next step would be simply just add project. Nice. Now, the really, really good thing that I like about Mo uh, Model Builder is, as you said, it's version one, but it's already the fourth, uh, like uh, 1.4 uh, oh, version. Okay, already so out. they are updating steadily. Yeah, and I'm noticing like, you know, this thing didn't exist uh, before then. When you had data, you couldn't select columns. You, right. Uh, my demos were literally, I'm deleting physically uh, the columns. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I had to modify the data in order to make it work. Right. But now you actually get the instructions how to run it. So uh, they tell you, yeah, you need to switch to this uh, right project. Mm -hmm. Um, you're getting a NASA class library. Uh, previously, you just get the model, uh, the inputs and output uh, mm -hmm. model, which is the representation of the uh, CSV. Uh, so basically, this is all the CSV. And mm -hmm. then the model understands which columns to ignore and how to process. Model essentially is the knowledge base. How do I get from this input to result? Right. That transformation. And we don't actually have to understand it. No, it's, it's been like, generated for us and it works. So yeah. we're, we're kind of done. Yeah, and this p part is uh, when you want to retrain, uh, the only thing you need to send to the clients mm -hmm. is this uh, zip file. Replace that file. Yes. As long as the input and output are the same, mm -hmm. you just send that file. Nice. Boom, done. Pretty simple. Yeah. And you can also see it's the actual code to recognize uh, right. things, uh, to do the uh, predictions. Uh, is very simple. We load the model, we create a pre uh, predictor, which mm -hmm. basically takes the model that knows how to do transformation, and now we can do predictions. And a good tip is the model itself, this part, is thread safe. Right. So you can have it like a single turn in dependence injection, mm -hmm. where the predictor is not thread safe. So this okay. is something you want to have it as a transient dependency. Right. So that's, you want that's smart. Yes. But not a lot of code and not a lot of intensive CPU here. Training model yes. way harder work than operating model. Yeah, once you have the model, you can ship it to uh, your uh, mobile devices sure. and they will be uh, pretty quick to process that. That's nice. Yeah. But and, and it does actually know the ones it's not certain of. So it is easy for you from a code perspective to go give me your, your uncertain items so that I can review them. Yes. So what they do is you can actually run the application. Mm -hmm. And here, you, what you're getting is uh, the results. So it gets apparently random one, but it's always the first. Right. It's supposed <laughs> to be random. First is random sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you don't expect it's first, it feels random. <laughs> um, but what it does, it gives you not only the prediction, but over here, you can see that it also gives you some random numbers. Right. So this is basically giving you the weight. How sure uh, that each of those right. labels... You, can you call it confidence? Yeah, yeah confidence. Okay. Um, confidence is a little bit tricky because 
it's all transformation. So it's just, oh. sometimes it's confidence, but it's based on how the training model is made. Sometimes it's just things are being added up and this number just happened to be bigger. Nice. Okay. Yeah. It's very interesting once you get deep into machine learning, but usually if it's really high number, it's probably it. Yeah. If you have a lot of numbers that are similar, but just one bumps up, it's probably not right. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. So here, the problem I usually see is like, this is massive improvement from what they did from 1.3, from 1.1. 1.03. 1. 1. 1. Uh, yeah. Right. And... But what I like to do is I have some snippets. Okay. And I want to copy those snippets. And what is going to help us? So here is just the code. We're just literally just taking a random sample. Random? Mm -hmm. uh, for here. Random starting at one. Ah, yeah. Okay, now they change it. It's no longer uh, just saying single instance. It used okay. to be random. And what I'm going to do is just replace this output with this one. And when I run this, uh, we should see a little bit better result. So what we're now seeing is, okay, I have here the Spotify, just one uh, transaction. Right. But what I'm seeing here is, hey, it's leisure. It's uh, 83, uh, 88%. Right. Sure, that's, that's the correct label. And right. you can see how it thinks about other stuff. Okay, so, so that's per item. That it's, a, it's pretty sure 88% yeah. is pretty confident that that's leisure. That's correct. Okay. But I'll show you also the pitfalls. <laughs> so here I have um, a transaction. I'll copy this uh, snippet here. And what I have is uh, I'm uh, putting, uh, well, I'm part of the .NET Foundation mm -hmm. and I'm uh, donating uh, money to .NET uh, Foundation. And what we have here, ah, sorry, the wrong code over here. And here I have a transaction that um, it's going to work. So right. we run it and it will mark it as investment. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, then that's not correct. Actually, sorry. Uh, we need to close it. Okay. So we have investment and it's very, very short. Right. right? That's very high. Nine, oh, yes. Not above 90% for sure. But what happens if I change? Oh, by the way, it doesn't matter those values. Those right. are just for uh, other demos yeah. they have. But if I change one number, hmm. what do you think will happen? I would think nothing. It's such a minor change. Well, do you think it's food? Now they think it's food because you changed one number. So what ha is happening is most of my transactions happen to be food. Right. And when uh, this minor change, the problem is the description column is hashed. Oh, okay. So a minor change, it will make it a unknown uh, uh, entity. Right. So what it's going to do is just like, okay, I haven't seen that before. So I'll just make it as that thing. Right. The thing that's most probable. For yes. Okay. So this is one danger <laughs> of machine learning. You sure. Can, like you can make a really nice prototype, but then you make small changes and it just doesn't work. Yeah, and you get these but, surprises in your data. Yeah, but one reason why I wanted to show this is it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my snippets here is this one. I'll just copy that. And what we're going to look is how the uh, model is actually generated. Mm -hmm. So here we have create model. And he it generates uh, the it loads the training data it lo uh, makes a training pipeline mm -hmm. and other things. What I'm going to focus here is actually just the training pipeline and specifically the description. Right. So what we see here it's categorical and one hot hash encoding. Hmm. What does that mean? Any change will make it completely different. Right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to replace it with text. Feature text. Oh, okay. And that so will give no us... No more hashing. Yeah. And so minor changes are seen as minor changes. Yes. That's wow. That one minor change. Yeah. Hopefully, if we have time, what we uh, can do is quickly do model.create. And I'll just return it because uh, the model uh, zip is not going to be copied to bin folder yet. Right. 
So what I'm uh, doing right now, I'm actually retraining with the same uh, CSV mm -hmm. back to the model. Now there's also one little bug. Sometimes. In, so when you have con model builder here, sometimes it converts underscore to dot. So that's something. Oh, that you've had that before. You fixed that way too fast, JK. <laughs> that wasn't a surprise for you. Yes, uh, I've been uh, practicing this, right. uh, but I kind of forgot about it mm -hmm. for a moment. And now we have a new model. Uh, and the next thing I will have to do is rebuild. Right. Uh, so it will copy this model over here into bin folder. Mm -hmm. It's just how the, the project currently is uh, constructed, the one that is auto-generated. And I'm going to go back to- Are you still having to redo the processing time, the 30 seconds? Now, this is a bit faster because it already knows which training algorithm to pick. Uh, I see. So the time it took figuring out the algorithm by comparing them doesn't need to do that now. Yes. Yeah, so now it already knows all the configuration. Okay. Now it just runs the training uh, really quickly. So I think it was like five seconds, even okay. less. Fast enough. So, it's just part of your compile. Yeah. And now if you run this, if the demigods are, are happy. Uh, you landed back in investment again with that new data. That's correct. And that confidence is even higher. Yes. <laughs> and that's because what uh, tokenization does is basically it takes bits and pieces of the text hmm. and splits them apart. Right. So it's no longer looking at uh, as, as a whole, it's looking at parts of the text. Right. And to prove you that that's how it works, I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to remove you, most you of You took it. a lot of data out there. You took even more data out. Yes. I'll just close this one first. Right. And now if all the stars align. Mm, I like how close you're flying to the sun here, JK. Yeah, just need to compile it. Yep. Still got it right. Confidence is lower, but yes. you have very little data. That's correct. Yeah, that's and impressive. If we have, yeah, and if we clean up the data that we only have, you know, those unique uh, uh, pieces of uh, description, the confidence would be much higher. But then you also uh, came to a risk where you uh, you need to understand how uh, to make all the descriptions unique, mm -hmm. so you don't have collisions. I get it. That's awesome. Yeah. So this is where just putting a little bit of data science mm -hmm. uh, makes uh, this actually a very viable uh, prototype that can even be push to production and people can be happy for, uh, right. about it for years. And you're not taking any shortcuts. If you want data scientists to drill it and so forth, what you've built here can be adapted, modified, and grown on. Yeah. And one thing that I want to emphasize is if ML.net doesn't really cover everything that your data scientists want, mm -hmm. you can consume other models, okay. on machine learning models. Awesome. And it doesn't really change too much your code. Mm -hmm. But what allows you to do is you do the machine learning in your project, and now you uh, you can work on that, improve that, and the more you learn machine learning, the better it gets. Sure. Rather than, hey, we want to have machine learning. Oh, wait, I need to learn machine learning. I need learning. to do this giant jump. Like you've yes. now got that gentle access into this area. By the time you see enough value to spend the resources it would take to get those data scientists and other models going, you already know there's value there. Yes. That's really compelling. Yeah. And for the people who really want to uh, do similar thing like that, but they don't want to uh, mess around with the uh, column descriptions and stuff like right. that, I have something for them. So I've been uh, trying to uh, simplify the, um, uh, the process of how do you mm -hmm. get to your first prototype. And what I have here is you can define a description. And by the way, this is a Blazor client site. Nice. And a little web assembly going on here. Yeah, I'll just do categories. I can read the CSV file, uh, mm -hmm. re read the description. And now what I can do is I can select that this description is a tokenizer. Okay. And here you can define all the namespace and stuff like that. Now, this is something what Model Builder already does. Right. But what I'm uh, having you here can, control. Yeah, a bit more explicit. You, yes. You, what that column actually represent. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, unfortunately very important as you have seen. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's much trickier to hack through the code and make the right change versus what you just showed here, just select the correct option. Yeah, and if you see, it's basically the same thing. Sure. I'm just adding one small uh, additional uh, option. And here is the code that you can copy paste into your project. Right. 
And whereas in the previous example, we have already selected a uh, training algorithm. Mm -hmm. Here is uh, what I'm doing is using AutoML uh, NuGet package, mm -hmm. which is exactly the thing that uh, the model builder is using. Right. But I'm showing it the code. Right. So now instead of using the specific training algorithm once you get the model, now you can try and get a new one, mm -hmm. a better one, every single time. That's really neat. Well, JK, I really enjoyed your demonstration. You've made it clear to me that we can hack at machine learning in our apps and do experiments for low cost, low amount of time. And if you find some value, put some more effort into it without wasting anything. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. Yeah, thank you for having me here. That was good fun. And I hope you enjoyed this. Check out all the other SSW videos. Thanks for watching.